you know, I feel like a lot of people that I've known in the past have entered a relationship through a sexual connection, a sexual chemistry, erotic experiences, mm -hmm. fun times, things like that. And then they start dating and then they start entering a relationship based on that foundation as opposed to based on what do you see for your life? You know, what are the values, the background, the culture, the religion, the money, all these different things. Do you want kids? Do you not want kids? And I feel like that ends up being a, a struggle for a lot of people, myself included in my past, until I started, I tried something differently. You um, first had the sex and then you met the person. <laughs> exactly, yeah. And, and created a, a story about who the person would be, right? Mm -hmm. Without actually communicating in a, and giving space and time to experience who the person was, right? And same for them with me. Why do you think most people start things that way, you know, in general, as opposed to, hey, let's give it time. Let's ask deeper, more intimate questions like you have in your game. Let's get to know each other. Why do you think that is? First of all, that only began to happen with the democratization of contraception. Mm. This is before the 68, this was not possible. Mm -hmm. So it's not, it's very recent, right? you know, that we start making love first and then we find out each other's names. Well, is, that, is, that, is that true all over the world or is that more in the U.S.? Or is it's that true more? wherever people can experience, you know, premarital sex, mm -hmm. basically. Yeah. Um, in the past, you first had to marry in order to, to be able to have sex. And right. when I say in the past, it's in the past here. And that's when I was a teenager. And, um, and in much of the world, it still is the case. Mm -hmm. So we are part of a very sexualized society in which sexual freedom and sexual expression has become a part of our values, mm. right? Sexuality That's used so to true. be a part of our biology, and now it's and a part of our condition. Now it's a part of our identity. And so we have changed the meaning of sex in the, in the culture at large, and then we have changed it in our relationships. And so we start from a place of attraction. You know, am I drawn to you? Am I attracted to you? Am I, you know, it's the first thing I think when I, I swipe. What do mm -hmm. I do? I look at, you know, where do I get a little frisson, you know? <laughs> who, do, who, who catches my attention? Mm -hmm. And it's purely physical, you know? So... It is, a, it is a recent development. It's for most of the people here, this is not their grandparents' story. So this is right. still in the family. It's not like you have to go into history books. Sure. How do you feel like people could set up for a healthier relationship as opposed to, uh, what would you recommend or suggest them for people in order to have a healthier foundation? Seeing that it seems so sexualized now, everything seems so like, physical swiping, looking at someone's sexual identity, attraction, as opposed to, I guess, true intimacy and connection. How would you set up a relationship now? There's so many um, different pieces to this. I think the first thing, look, I, I, I am right about sexuality. I'm, the, I'm not going to minimize it, but I do understand that, you know, it's very important. It's a beautiful thing to have a powerful erotic connection with someone, but don't confuse the metaphors. You can have a beautiful erotic connection with someone, and that does not necessarily translate into a life experience. Right, a life story. A yeah. life story. That said, um, the next thing that changed culturally, if you want to really take uh -huh. on the big myths, it's the notion that we are looking for the one and only. Mm -hmm. The one and only, um, my, my soulmate. It's my everything. Yes, my everything. Your soulmate used to be God. Mm -hmm. Not a person. Mm -hmm. You know, the one and only was the divine. And with this one and only today, I want to experience wholeness and ecstasy and meaning and transcendence. And I'm going to wait 10 more years. We are waiting 10 years longer to settle with someone, to make a commitment to someone, for those of us who choose a someone. And if I'm going to wait longer, and if I'm looking around, and if I'm choosing among a thousand people at my fingertips, you bet that the one who's going to capture my attention is going to make me delete my apps better be the one and only. Mm. So in a, in a period of proliferation of choices, we at the same time have an ascension of expectations about a romantic relationship that is unprecedented. We have never expected so much of our romantic relationships as we do today in the West. It seems like a lot of pressure. It's an enormous amount of pressure. 
we crumble under the weight of these expectations <laughs> because a community cannot become a tribe of two. Mm -hmm. This is a party of two. And with you and me together, we are going to create best friends, romantic partners, lovers, confidants, parents, intellectual eagles, business partners, business yeah, partners yeah. career coaches, <laughs> I mean, you name it. And I'm like, seriously? One person for everything? One person instead of a whole village? Mm -hmm. So that's the first myth. And the notion of unconditional love that accompanies this is that when I have that one and only, I have what you call clarity, but mm -hmm. translated into certainty, uh -huh. peace, <laughs> uh -huh. and freedom, uh -huh. you know, or safety, yes. which is the other side of the same thing. So that's, that to me is if you want to set yourself up, really the idea that you're going to find one person for everything is a myth. Mm -hmm. Keep a community around you. Absolutely. Keep a, 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 a set of deep friendships, really deep friendships, deep intimacies with part, with friends, with mentors, with family members, with colleagues, you know, that. Mm -hmm. So that's the first thing for me in having good relationships is, is um, diversify. It's diversify like, relationships, yes, but yes. not sexually. Yeah. No, no. Right. For some people, it will include that. For the vast majority, it won't. But the notion that there isn't a one person for everything, and that that doesn't mean that there is a problem in your relationship when that happens. Mm -hmm. The second thing is stop constantly looking at people as a product, where you evaluate them. And you evaluate yourself. You know, in our market economy, everything has become a product. We include it. And so love seems to have become the moment that the evaluation of the product stops. You have finally been approved mm. when you have been chosen and when you choose. This is Eva Iluz, a sociologist who writes about this very beautifully. It's like love finally becomes the, mom the moment you can experience peace. You're no longer looking, selling yourself, proving yourself, trying to capture somebody's attention. It's exhausting. And once you are in that mentality, you also are continuously looking for the best product. You never say, you know, how can I meet a person who? People don't often talk about how can I be a person who? That's so true. Okay, so it's what you're looking for mm -hmm. in the market economy of romantic love rather than who are you? How do you show up? What do you bring? What responsibility do you take? How generous are you, etc. Absolutely. Second thing for what I think sets you up for a better relationship. And the third thing is understand some of the things that are really important to you and don't get involved with someone on the hope that some things will change. Mm. Do things ever change with a partner that yes. you want to change? Yes, things do change a lot. I mean, lot in, many different things can occur in a relationship, but it's different from I'm coming in here <laughs> right <laughs> to to turn things around you know because so much of us wants the experience of acceptance so absolutely with acceptance i would say this another thing to prepare yourself um you can love a person wholly w h o l l y without having to love all of them what do you mean by that? It means that the notion of unconditional love is a myth. Adult love lives in the realm of ambivalence, which means that relational ambivalence is part and parcel of all our relationships. We have it with our parents, our siblings, mm -hmm. our friends, which means that we continuously have to integrate contradictory feelings and thoughts between love and hate, between excitement and fear, between envy and contempt, mm -hmm. between boredom and aliveness. It's, you continuously negotiate these contradictions. That ambivalence and living with that ambivalence is actually a sign of maturity mm -hmm. rather than continuously then evaluating. See, in the beginning, you evaluate, is this the right one? Is this the one and only? Is this the... Then it becomes, shall I stay or shall I go? How do I know I have found the one is the pre-marital or the pre-commitment relationship. And then afterwards it becomes, is it good enough? Mm. We continuously continue with the evaluations, right? Is it good enough? Or how happy am I? Am I happy enough? So that's the unconditional love. No, we live with ambivalence in our relationship. There are periods where we think, 
what would life be like elsewhere? Mm. And then we come back and then we say, I can't imagine it without it. This is what I've chosen. I'm good here. But it's a conversation. The idea that you will be accepted unconditionally is a dream we have for our parents when we are babies. It's not part of adult love. Right. So is unconditional love is not something that we can expect. Unconditional from a love is a myth. Mm -hmm. So the one and only is a myth. You, yeah. you asked me how do we set ourselves up for the best for relationships yeah. up front. There is no one and only. Mm. There is one person that you choose at a certain moment in time and with that person you try to create the most beautiful relationship you can. But you could have done it with others. Mm -hmm. Timing is involved. Lots of things are involved. So there is no one and only. There's no soulmate. Soulmate is God. Mm -hmm. You can think that you have a soulmate connection with someone, that you have a deep, deep meeting of the minds, of the souls, of the heart, of the bodies. But it's a metaphor. It's not a person. It's the quality of an experience that feels like soulmate. Mm -hmm. That's number two. Number three, there is no unconditional love. We live with ambivalence in our deepest love relationships. There are things we like and things we don't, and things they like about us and things they don't, and moments they can't, exp they can't be without us and moments where they wish on occasion they could be away from us. <laughs> right. And that's normal. Mm -hmm. Number four, the happiness mandate. M continuously evaluating how happy I am, you know, how, if you continuously pursue happiness, you're miserable a lot of the time. Mm -hmm. What should we pursue instead? We pursue integrity, depth, joy, aliveness, connection, growth. Those things that ultimately make us say, I feel good. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm happy about this. But I don't pursue happiness. Uh -huh. Happiness is the, con the consequence of a lot of things you put in. You pursue caring for someone, having their back feeling they have your back, wanting the best for them, what the Pali people call compersion. You know, those things you can pursue. Compersion? What's compersion? Compersion is feeling joy for the happiness of the other person. Is this a polyamory relationships? It's a concept it's like that they're is... with a, another yes, sexual partner. But I think the word is bigger than just, uh, you know, contained within the Pali community and culture. It is uh, the notion that you want good for the other person yes. even when it doesn't have to do with you. Right. You're proud of them. You admire them. You you enjoy their their mm -hmm. growth, their successes. You know. What about when um, someone says, you know, I'm with this person. They make me happy. What does that happen when you're looking for someone to make you happy in the relationship? Well, the day they don't, you will say they make me unhappy, mm -hmm. or they don't make me happy. But it's they. They do to me. I'm the recipient of what they do. They have the power. Uh -huh. They can give. They can withhold. I depend, I crave, I long, I yearn, I respond to them. What are, and what should we be thinking of instead of this person makes me happy? How, we, should we, how should we approach that? We give each other a good foundation from which we can each launch into our respective worlds. Ooh, that's cool. A home is a foundation with wings. Uh-huh. Or... I like to think a good a, a relationship is a foundation with wings. So you feel the stability that you need, the security, the safety, the predictability as much as you can, as much as our life allows us. And at the same time, you have the wings to go and explore, discover, be curious, be in the world, sometimes together and sometimes apart. Mm -hmm. If everything's fine, why don't you go to therapy? And if you already need to go in the beginning, there must be something really wrong because who goes? And that is so old for me. That has been scrapped, you know. Uh -huh. You go because you have a sense that you want to prepare yourself. You want to bring your strengths 